in the 2 to the 31st place? Or is it a 1 in the 2nd uh, to the 32nd space? Okay, so let's go ahead and talk about that, you know, when, that's, you know, okay. when we get into the lecture. But it's so easy, it's just yes or no, which one is it? <laughs> Well, but since this is a class for the entire class, True. we'll go ahead and address that to the whole class. Okay, so let's go ahead and get started, and I'll let you ask that question again, so the rest of the class can hear that. Um, on a 32-bit number, um, is you rec said that the highest number it can be is 2 billion, 400 million something. Um, does that mean that a 1 is in the 2 to the 31st place, or a 1 is in the 2 to the 32nd place, and does that 1 equal 2 million 400 billion? Okay, so or, to or do answer that... have ones all the way down? Okay, so we'll go ahead and you know, attempt to answer that question, okay? Okay, first of all, what is a 32-bit number? A 32-bit number, oh, okay, let's go all the way back. What is a bit, B-I-T, what is a bit? A bit is... It's a binary digit, okay? That's the original name, or that's the, that's the reason why it's called a bit, because it is B for binary, and then IT comes from the last two characters of digit, okay? So it's, it's a binary digit. Um, we are used to decimal digits, right? I mean, when you guys you know, talk about numbers, you know, it's all decimal digits. So now the question is, you know, what does it mean when you look at a number in decimal? So we'll go ahead and take a look at the number like 729 in decimal. Okay, what does that mean? Well, seven is a digit, but what that what is that digit what is that digit representing? It is representing that we have seven hundreds, right? The two is representing we have two tens, and then the nine is representing that we have nine ones. <clears throat> and of course, everybody knows this part. What is a hundred? A hundred is ten to the power of two, right? Uh, what is 10? 10 is 10 to the power of 1. And what is 1? 1 is 10 to the power of 0. So that's basically what a number is. Okay, when we talk about a number in base 10, every digit is telling us the quantity of a particular power of 10. Okay, how many of these powers of 10 do we have in the value that we are representing? So let's go talk about numbers versus values, okay? What is the difference between a value as opposed to what is a number? A value is just something, okay? So when I show you this, this is a value. But when you say three, three is a number. It is just one way to represent that particular value one way to tell other people what value you're talking about. So if I, if the convention is not base 10 and instead it is binary, when the value to represent is this, people would have said 1, 1. Because 1, 1 as a binary number represents the same value. Are we doing okay so far with those concepts? So we are not going, to, we are going to change from base 10 to base 2. So with base two, we'll just uh, try a four-digit base, uh, base two number, okay? So we'll try 1011 as a base two number. So what this means is we have one of two to the power of three, which is the, what we know as eight. Uh, we have zero of two to the power of two, so we don't have any fours. We have one of two to the power of one, so we have one, two. And we also have 1 times 2 to the power of 0, which means we have 1, 1. So that's what a binary number is read. And each digit, again, is representing the quantity of a particular power, but not of 10 anymore. But this time it is a power of 2, because it's a base 2 number. Are we still doing OK so far with that concept? Okay, it's really the same thing as a base 10 number because each digit is still, is still telling us how, what is the quantity of a particular power of that base. Okay, so let's look at a 32-bit 30, number. A 32-bit number has 32 bits, right? So let's, let's try to make a 32-bit number here. I'm just going to make a, a 32 question marks here. One, two, okay, that's eight. That's 16, and now we have 32. So a 32-bit number is simply 
32 binary digits right next to each other, each one representing the quantity of a particular power of 2 in the value that we are trying to represent. Okay? And your question is, okay, when we look at the value of or the values that, that can be represented by a binary number, what is the maximum? What is the, what does the what is the maximum? What what does it look like, right? Okay. So now we have two things that we have to talk about. You know, we have signed integers and we also have unsigned integers. In other words, if you are only given with 32 bits and you are asked to represent both positive and negative values, what are you going to do? We don't have a sign here, okay? So the answer is we use what we call a two's complement, which is a topic in CISP 310. So I'm not going to go into that topic too much. For the most part, okay, um, I can just tell you that if you have a number where everything is a one except for the least, for the most significant bit, which is the leftmost digit, this is representing the most. This is representing the most positive, the biggest value you can represent in as a signed number. So that number turns out to be two to the power of um, two to the power of thirty-one minus one. Okay. So let me put a parenthesis around this because ah, ah, I'm moving the wrong thing. It's two to the power of thirty-one, which is going to be a, a even number minus one. That is the largest number you can represent using thirty-two bits. Yep. Where does the minus one come in? Because it all makes sense except for that minus one. Because well, it all makes sense because two to the power of thirty-one is going to be one followed by thirty-one zeros. But if you have all ones here, that means you know, it's that number minus one. And so, if uh, that biggest number, uh, where's the location of the ones in that in, in, in the biggest number? Huh? Is that the, to, to in order to make a number two million two two. Uh, billion four hundred million the biggest 32 bit signed integer what does yeah. that look like on zeros and ones they're all ones except for the most significant bit which is is which is two to the power of 31 the most significant is the placeholder but that's only power. if you look at it as a uh, unsigned integer what 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 place is that first one in is this one two? yeah that's a bit 31 that's bit 31 and then this so, is bit zero so the first one is in the two to the 30th place that this is how good. many ones, this is how many 2 to the power of 30. Okay. This, in another context, would be representing how many 2 to the power of 31. But that's not the case here because we are using the signed, num we're using signed numbers. So it's represented differently. Okay? The most negative number you can represent turns out to be this. So we have you know, 1 as the most significant digit and all zeros for the rest of the number. And that turns out to represent the value of 2 to the power of 31, but without a minus 1. Okay? Um, okay, since we're on this topic, and I think this is a very important topic, let's not talk about 32 bit numbers because they tend to be huge, right? You know, and it's hard to enumerate and give you exactly all the different values. So instead, we'll look at 4 bit numbers. Okay? We'll look at numbers that are only 4 bit wide. 4 bit numbers. Okay, this is a 4-bit number, and this is the next 4-bit uh, number, the next one, next one. So I will actually act, I will actually enumerate all the uh, binary numbers in 4 bits, okay? Uh, are you guys seeing a pattern here, you know, how I come up with these numbers? Okay, there should be 16 of these, okay? Um, given four binary digits, four bits, these are all the combinations of zeros and ones that I can come up with. Is that part making any sense? Okay, but each one does not necessarily represent a particular value. A value is, in, is, is an interpretation, okay? So if you want to add interpretation to these numbers, um, the, most easy, the easiest one is to call this one a zero. This represents 1, this represents 2, 3, 4, these are all easy ones, 6, 7. Now the big question is, what is this one going to represent? If I choose 8, 9, so and so on, then we have no ability to represent negative numbers. 
okay? But let's go ahead and just look at them, okay? So this is eight, this is representing nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, and 15, okay? So if we choose to look at a four bit number, but only using the non-negative values, this is the range of numbers that we can actually represent from zero to 15. There's a total of 16 values that we can represent, um, but in terms of the values, they go from zero to 15. Are we doing okay so far with this? Okay, but how many times you know, in a computer program will we, are we going to have a need to represent negative values? Well, quite a lot, okay? A lot of calculations, you know, a lot of data that we have to store involves you know, both positive and negative numbers. So now the question is, how do we represent a negative number? Well, as it turns out, this is how we do it, okay? So this is the, this is the unsigned interpretation. The next column is going to represent the signed interpretation. So we'll still have the same eight numbers or the same eight uh, values for the first part here. So everything up to seven will still be the same. And then what we'll do is to go to the bottom here and then say, oh, by the way, um, one, 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 one will also be used to represent negative one. This is going to represent two. This is going to represent three, negative three, negative four, negative five, negative six, negative seven, and this is also representing negative eight. So depending on your choice of interpretation, you can choose to look at 1011, for example, as a positive number, which is 11, or you can choose to interpret it as a negative value, which is negative five. Which way are you going to interpret it? It depends on the logic of your program. What are you representing using these four bits? Is that okay? I mean, does everybody kind of get an idea of the same bit pattern can have different interpretations. Yep, go ahead. Because you tell it. The computer does not know until you tell it. Now, when we use integers in this class, except for u in 32 underscore t, when we use int int, it is implicitly signed which means you know, we will we'll use half of the values on the non-negative side and the other half on the negative side. Okay, yep. So an integer set that's only negative values by default? Yes, integers are signed by default. Well, but I mean like only negative. So like an unsigned integer, but from negative numbers. Wait, 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 that, that doesn't make, it doesn't make any sense. Unsigned numbers for negative values, that's well, not. Well, but so like the unsigned integer type is only positive integers. Only so non-negative integers, yes. Yeah, so I was curious if there was a t type that was only negative integers. No, and there's no integer. type for only negative. You can have unsigned numbers, which means you have the entire, in this case, all 16 combinations will be representing non-negative values. Or you can have a signed interpretation where half of these will be non-negative values and the other half will be negative values. Uh, is the biggest number in 32-bit uh, not have a 1 in the 2 to the 31st place because uh, it has to make room, 32-bit number has to make room for negative numbers as yes. well? Yep, yep, That's, it's basically the same pattern because the most significant bit is also called the sign bit when you look at the signed number. If this is a 1, it is representing a negative value. But all of this stuff we'll go over in CISP 310, okay? You know, so this is a little bit beyond you know, the scope of this class, but since the question was asked, you know, I just decided, well, you know, it doesn't hurt to give you guys an early exposure of something that most of you will encounter in CISP 310, yep? We've gone over how to convert uh, like, um, integers to binary numbers that are unsigned, Negative? like that are all positive, like right, right. Like, decimal binary conversions. But doesn't that pattern break down when you start getting to negative values to easily convert in some ways? <laughs> well, the way we negate a number in binary is called two's complement. So what you do is you take the absolute value that you want to convert, do it first into a unsigned number, and then you use two's complement to negate it. So we can still do it, it's just not exactly the same. Okay. Yep. Right. Those are all very good questions. Are there any additional questions about uh, what we are talking about here? No 
questions? All right. I was just chatting with another student, not from this class, and uh, they were asked to do a homework assignment involving bitwise and. And you know, and I was trying to help out to explain things, and they go like, "Okay, you know, if you look at a number as a binary number, we are basically doing a and operation, but on a bitwise you know, uh, manner, which means you know, bit three of bit three, uh, bit three of both numbers will be ended to become bit three of the result of the numbers." And then the guy said, "But we were never taught about you know binary numbers at all." And they go like, "How can you talk about bitwise operations without understanding?" Binary numbers. That just does not uh, lie. Yep. For a system assigned integer values, where, where does it determine where to split the number if it's an odd? It's, uh, it's the most significant bit. The most significant bit, or what we some of us know as the leftmost bit, is the one bit that is also used for sign indication. Now, there's another way to look at this, okay? If you, when you look at this you know, linearly, it doesn't seem to make sense. You know, why would negative, negative eight be right next to seven? It does not seem to make any sense, right? But when you look at this as a number wheel, I think I'm pretty sure we talked about this already, okay? But we'll go ahead and talk about it again because this is actually a very important concept. If you look at the number wheel, okay, then let's, let's say this is zero, okay? And this is gonna be four. This is going to be 8, this is going to be 12, using the unsigned interpretation, okay? So we have 1 here, this is 0, 0, 0, 0, this is 0, 0, 0, 1, and what do you think is on this side? 1, 0, 0, 0, or 1, 1, 1, 1, 1. It's 1, 1, 1, 1, okay? Now, why is it 1, 1, 1, 1? Well, because if you keep going like this, 8 is also known as 1, 0, 0, 0 in binary. Okay, if, you, if you just follow the table, you can see 8 is 1, 0, 0, 0, right? What is 9? 1, 0, 0, 1. What is 10? 1, 0, 1, 0. What is 11? 1, 0, 1, 1. 12 is 1, 1, 0, 0. 13 is 1, 1, 0, 1. 14 is 1, 1, 1, 0. 15, which is what we see here, now is 1, 1, 1, 1. Does that make any sense? Because we're counting clockwise, okay? 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, all the way, and then this is 15, using the unsigned interpretation. Is that okay? What happens when we try to walk backwards or decrement numbers? We are, we are looking at numbers counterclockwise. So if you subtract 1 from 2, which is 0, 0, 1, 0, you get 0, 0, 0, 1. What happens when you subtract 1 from 0, 0, 0, 1? You get 0. That makes sense so far, right? What happens when you subtract 1 from 0, which is 0, 0, 0, 0? You're going to go on to the other side, it becomes 1, 1, 1, 1. So that's why you know, 1, 1, 1, 1 in a sign interpretation is representing negative 1. Because when you, when you go counterclockwise one step from 0, 0, 0, 0, you get 1, 1, 1, 1. Is that OK? Kind of. Okay, all right. So you, you will definitely see this again in CISP 310 because CISP 310 is a low level class. We talk about your know, gates, your know, transistors, you know, um, how a processor is actually you know, designed and the components inside the processor. So these are all really important topics in CISP 310, but an early exposure is never gonna hurt. This is your new homework assignment. Okay, because some people have been asking me, what is the next homework assignment? I wanted to have more. So this is your next homework assignment, and you might recall the format you know, in some of the other homework assignments, because I just copied and pasted from some of the, one of the other homework assignments. This is more division, okay? It is doing division without using division, okay? Remember the last one, you have to do it iteratively using a loop? This one is gonna do it recursively, okay? So once again, we have to deal with recursion because I really want you guys to understand you know, what is recursion. Um, and the, yep, go ahead. You already have your test cases up here. I have some of the test cases, most okay. of the important ones, yes. <laughs> okay, so we can like, let's intentionally go in knowing what the test cases will be? I would say if your code works for all of these four test cases, there's a good chance that it's gonna work for all test cases. 
unless your code specifically only works for these four test cases, which I can see some people doing. <laughs> <laughs> just to say, but my program works for these four cases. You know, how come you know you gave me like zero points? Yep. Did you pick a recursion question uh, <clears throat> based off of how the class did on the tests on the question, the, the questions on the test? Did I grade it based on the? No. Did you give us homework based on maybe the lack of yeah, knowledge yeah. Mm -hmm. that people had from the? But test? this one also has a twist because you know. Okay, let's let's take a look. I don't really have a whole set, you know, preset uh, uh, homework, you know, in this class. You know, I usually don't do that. Instead, you know, I just look at, you know, what is the, what is, what seems to be necessary. You know, what kind of topic you guys need more practice on, and then we'll do that. Okay. So more division is here, and we have the main.cpp file. All right. So this is the the program that you're supposed to work with. And your code has to go into the subroutine called divide. So we'll just go ahead and focus on divide, which is you know, here. This is called a prototype of a subroutine. It tells us several things. Void is called the return type. It is telling us that this subroutine does not return a particular value. Because the return type is void, you cannot put the, the invocation of this subroutine where an integer is expected, for instance. Okay? So this call, the, a call to this subroutine has to be on its own. Okay? It cannot be a part of an expression. Um, it, the prototype tells us about the name of the subroutine. The, the subroutine is called divide. It also gives us a list of the parameters. Okay? So what is inside the parentheses from here all the way up to here are the parameters. The parameters are basically a way for the invoking code to communicate with the subroutine itself and say, hey, subroutine divide, I want you to process these things. Okay? So there are four things in this case because we are dealing with division. In order to perform division, you will have to give the subroutine a dividend. You will have to give the subroutine a divisor. Okay? So those two are put called the inputs into the subroutine. But instead of just wanting a quotient or just wanting a remainder, I want both of them. Okay? And there's no way I can return both values using a return value. So the only way I can do that is to use pass by reference. When you see this ampersand symbol right before the name of a parameter, it, is, it means quotient is passed by reference. It means remainder is another parameter. It is also passed by reference. How many people still remember what is passing by reference? Okay, what, is, what, what does it do? What is the purpose of passing by reference? So doesn't passing by a value take a copy yes. of the value and then uh, send it somewhere while passing by reference takes the actual physical... If you, if you can think of it like that. Like the, if the you... Value it's kind of like that. It, it, it gives the... It tells the subroutine where to find the item that it's supposed to process. That's basically what it's passing. Yep. Um, can't uh, passing by value, can passing by value manipulate an initialized <coughs> variable that had an assignment previously to the call called function by uh, the return of the function? So like say we have uh, a variable x equals 10 uh, assigned before we call our function. And then you pass x by value uh, through as a parameter to the function in the return statement. Can the returns after a manipulation of case. Done x? But I mean, is that possible at all? The return statement can can the return statement modify the the no. value of x? No, no, it just, no. no. What? The return statement takes an expression. Whatever the value of the expression is becomes the return value of the invocation. Now, when the when you when you do something like that, that means the return type cannot be void. Okay, the return type has to be an integer in order for the invocation to fit wherever an integer can go. But in this case, because the return type of divide is void, it means you cannot use return to return a particular value. You can use return to basically say I'm done, but you cannot say oh this is the return value of the invocation. Yep. Okay. Um. So are you saying when you want a function to manipulate already assigned variables, you're going to be passing by reference? Is that a universal, universal uh, agreement there? So that uh, the function does it something and then uh, returns 
Uh, it, this has nothing to do with returning. Okay. This is the subroutine having access. It knows how to access the thing that were used to pass to that parameter. Okay, since you asked a question, let's look at line 17. Okay, line 17 is the only line that is calling the subroutine. So let's try to link line 17 or relate line 17 to the prototype of line 1. Okay, how do those two match up? First of all, the name of the subroutine matches the name of the subroutine. Line 17 is called an invocation of a subroutine. We are actually saying, hey, subroutine, I want you to do something. Line 1 all the way to line 10 is called the definition of a subroutine. It is just saying, if anyone is interested in doing divide, this is how it's done. But it's just sitting there doing nothing because it's just a definition. Line 17 is saying, oh, I need to do some division right now. Who can help me? Oh, there is that subroutine called divide. You know, hey, subroutine divide, I want you to help me, you know, perform these operations. Okay? So the other parts that would also match up is 65 being the first argument when you are invoking a subroutine. The invocation does not specify, does not have parameters, instead it has arguments. So the argument of 65, which is which is just a you know constant value, is passed to parameter dividend. The second thing is 12, so the argument of 12 is passed to parameter divisor. The third one is x as, a, as an argument. It is passed to quotient as a passed by reference parameter. Okay, so let's stop right here, okay? What this means is um, dividend is kind of like a local variable, except it, is, it starts with a value of 65. Divisor is like a local variable, except it starts with a value of 12. Okay, so whatever I do with dividend or divisor doesn't impact main at all. Okay, there's no way you can impact anything in main. On the other hand, since I use x as an argument to specify the parameter quotient and quotient is passed by reference, that means whenever, whatever I do with quotient inside the subroutine, I am that I'm doing that to x of main. Is that okay? Technically speaking, a parameter that is passed by reference is quote unquote a way to find something. Okay? So quotient is basically an alias or just a way to access some other variable that is also an integer. So the same thing applies to y, which is the last argument of the function call. So this y here is the fourth argument. It is now passed to the fourth parameter of the subroutine. So remainder is a pass by reference parameter that is now linked to the variable y of main. And this is why if I write this code here from line 3 to line 9, whenever I access quotient as a result of this invocation, quotient is going to change. If I change quotient, it will change, it will change local variable x of main. If I change remainder, it will change y of main. Is that okay? Does everybody understand this particular concept? Hmm? Well, the program doesn't do a single thing. It doesn't do jack right now. <laughs> because you're going to tell it what to do. So ultimately, this is what I want the program to do. I want you to write your code. This is your homework assignment. So that's what you're going to do. Yep. If you have a void function like that that has absolutely no code in it, it wouldn't actually be a compiling error, though, would it? It would, just it would not be a compile error. The compiler would gladly take a subroutine that has nothing in it and say, sure, fine, if this is what you want to do, which is nothing, it's not illegal to do nothing. Okay. Yep. Okay, but to answer his question, okay, so what your code has to do is to perform the division. So I want the you know, quotient to store the quotient of the division. I want remainder to store the remainder of the division. What is the division? It's based on the name dividend and divisor. So quotient is dividend divided by divisor, and remainder is the di remainder of dividend divided by divisor. Is that okay? I mean, that, is that kind of, is that answering your question? Yep. Mm -hmm. By the end of this uh, class, uh, are we going to be able to see the role a function has and its ability to manipulate parameters, uh, 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 be able to manipulate things that are sent into it and what it returns, um, 
how that is helpful in a program. Basically, are we going to get a bigger vision of, of what a function, why its return value is important, and how that return value is used further into the program? Mm, yes. We are. We will, because right now it feels kind of compartmentalized just so we can understand the concepts. But I'm, I'm looking originally, finally, to see what. Well, it's, it's a way are. to reuse the same piece of code over and over again. So in terms of mechanism, it is not different from a subroutine in CISP 300. It's just that in CISP 300, you know, some people, you know, some instructors teach it in pseudocode, other people teach it in Visual Basic, but it's the same concept. So concept-wise, we are not introducing anything new at all. Okay, a function in C is a subroutine, also called a procedure, also called um, a module. Okay, depending on who you take it from. But the concept it does not really, you know, it doesn't change at all. So whatever you learned about subroutines in CISP 300, it's still the same here. It's just that the syntax is a little bit different. Is that making any sense? Okay. Yep. Question out of curiosity. Yep. Um, so by reference one, it was just basically using the address operator for rules. Do other languages usually have a separate address operator to use for by reference? Most other programming languages only have pass by reference. They do not have addresses or pointers. Okay, but in this class, we're not. I'm not talking about pointers yet. Okay, we're just talking about passing by reference at this point. Okay. Any other questions? No other questions. Okay, let me just give you a quick question there. Okay, because all of you should have taken CISP 300 already. So instead of having him ask me, I'm going to ask you guys, okay? <laughs> what is the purpose of a subroutine? Why do we have subroutines in programming? Yep, go ahead. To allow, well, basically, an expect process. And so if you have the module that is fundamentally basic enough, you can reuse it several times rather than have to rewrite that to make the code every single time. Okay. You want to add to it? It helps to organize your code, okay? So both of these are very important. It helps to organize your code, but it also has one more you know, purpose, okay? It not only helps organize your code, it also helps to abstract your code so that you know any changes to the underlying representation or the underlying way of doing things is now isolate, insulated from the rest of the program, okay? So those are the main concepts of a subroutine. You know, it's, 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 it's an... It's a mechanism to do what we call encapsulation or abstraction. Okay, okay. Let's go back to those concepts because you know, from the looks of you guys, you know, maybe not everyone has you know exposure to the concept of abstraction. Okay, what is abstraction? What does that word mean in programming? Okay, you guys can guess. Since your grade does not depend on your answer to this question, go ahead, give me your best shot. Okay, go, go ahead and Google. <laughs> and I will do the same. Yep, go ahead. When you look at the kind of instruction you take, um, so if you extract something else, so you're looking at the structure of the code, you're taking elements out of it, and you, how they interact with each other? You're taking some low level details out, okay? So you're retaining only something that is that makes sense, but only at a higher level, okay? So when you look up you know, Google, this is you know, what it describes in the abstraction, the quality of dealing with ideas rather than events, which uh, doesn't seem to relate to programming. Freedom from representational qualities in art, that has nothing to do with programming. So, yeah, sorry? There are more definitions. There are more definitions, and let's see, a state of preoccupation, no. A process of considering, sorry? Yes, it's getting rid of concrete uh, elements of something, okay? And number five is more. Number five, yeah. uh, the process of removing something, especially water from a river or other <laughs> <out of> source. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but this source does not, a, it's not source code, so, you know. Um, okay, so we can look up even more abstraction in programming, right? It, it popped up right. So abstraction in programming in computer science you know, gives you a long wiki page. Look, just look at this thumbnail. So, you know, just look at this your scroll bar here. 
you know, this is really, really long. So instead of reading this, which is going to bore me to death, that's why I'm not doing it, I'll give you an example, okay? How many people, you know, were old enough to remember CRT televisions? Okay, because some of you might have been helped, may have been asked to help your dad or mom or somebody else to move a 40 inch, you know, CRT TV from one side of the room to the, to the other side, right? How heavy are those things? Uh, okay, for, okay, let me ask you another question. Let's say you just bought one back in those days, okay? You just bought a 42 inch CRT TV, okay? You got it in your house. Are you worried at all that somebody's gonna steal it? No. <laughs> yes, the answer is correct, okay? You're, you're, you're absolutely right, nobody's gonna steal that because it's too heavy, okay? Um, and then it came along would be plasma TV. We still remember those plasma TV, which has completely faded away by today, the standard. And then we have LCD TV. We have OLED or organic LED TV. Uh, and then we have projectors and stuff like that, okay? So do you think the mechanism, the physics behind how an image is projected is the same across all of these devices? No. No. Okay, so I'll just give you a brief explanation of how it works, okay? A CRT is called, why is it called a CRT? Cathode ray tube, okay? So what does that mean? I like that, okay? So somebody knows, you know, a cathode ray means it is shooting electrons at high speed, okay? They use a magnetic coil to deflect the, the electron, okay? So it can go, you know, sweep across the screen. And the so-called screen is has phosphors, okay, which is, um, how do you call those things? Not luminescence, it's called? Oh. You, okay, it, when it's excited by a fast electron, it would actually emit light, okay? That's the property of the, of the screen of a TV, okay, of the CRT TV. So what do you do when you want to increase the uh, brightness of your picture? You can shoot more electrons, or you can also increase the velocity of the electron, because the faster the electron, the brighter the light is going to be, okay? Okay, so that's one. What about plasma TV? How does that work? Why is it called plasma? light goes through plasma Well, it's actually plasma. It's basically um, a little tube of plasma, which is kind of like a gas, but it's it's not, uh, it's not a gas where the electron and the nucleus have separated. So plasma actually is conductive, okay? So when you pass electricity through plasma, it emits light. Depending on the material, it will emit different light. This is why we have neon lights, okay? Neon light is a prime example of what called a plasma element because we are basically shooting electrons through um, plasma neon, not neon, is it neon? What kind of gas is in a, in a neon light? Uh, depends on the color. Depends on the color, but red is the most common. Red is neon. It's neon, okay. So we are shooting through neon plasma, and in the process, it will excite the neon, uh, the orbits, the electrons in the orbit of a neon nucleus to go you know, from one orbital to another orbital, and therefore emit light, okay? But to increase the intensity, how do you increase the intensity of a plasma light, a plasma TV? Please increase the flow of electrons. Exactly, increase the flow of electrons, and you know, just by increasing the current or the voltage across, you know, the plasma material, you will increase the intensity of the light. Very good. What about LCD TV, liquid crystal display (LCD)? How does it di display images? It's got a filament in there that, when charged, emits a certain color. Well, actually LCD is quite opposite to the other two mechanisms. The other two mechanisms are not deletive, they are additive. In other words, you are actively trying to make light that is a part of the image. LCD is exactly the opposite, okay? If you look at the backlight of all the monitors right in front of you or on your cell phone, if you look at just the backlight itself, it is easily four times the white color that you're seeing on the, on the screen itself. So what happened to the other 75% of the light? When you turn on your screen and you say, I want to display the color right, white, you're actually only looking at, at the most, 25% of the intensity of the backlight. Well, it has got polarization, 
okay? So everything is polarized in one way already. And then the liquid crystal element can polarize the other way. So when you have something polarized you know, horizontally, and then you add on top of that something that's uh, polarized vertically, then you have blocked just about 99% of the light, and it becomes a dark pixel. Okay, so that's how you know, LCD works. So how do you increase the intensity of um, a picture using LCD technology? Exactly, you can adjust the polarization or you can adjust the backlight, okay? And the backlight these days are mostly done by LEDs or light emitting diodes, okay? In the good old days, they're you know, fluorescent lights, you know, before, but now it's more energy efficient to use LEDs. Okay, so now we have just talked about, you know, three or four you know, different technologies to uh, create an image and to change the brightness. Do you ever need to know these things when you say, oh, that TV seems to, that screen is too dark, I need to you know, crank up the, uh, the brightness a little bit? No, there's standardized inputs. Okay, so what is the standardized input? If I were to ask you, you know, look at any you know, old, you know, not old, but any TV, and I say, okay, I want to increase the brightness of that picture, what would you do? Would you take a screwdriver, go to the back of the TV, unscrew the back panel, find the right you know, trim pot, and tweak it to increase the brightness. No, what do you do instead? <laughs> exactly, I like, I like that motion, it's like, just do this, right? Okay, this is abstraction, okay? Brightness control is an abstraction. Is an abstraction of what? The actual physical, ele electrical mechanism that changes that changes the brightness that you see, right? That's an abstraction because as a consumer, do you have to be a physicist to uh, to, to to work with a TV and change the brightness? No. Do you have to be an RF electrical engineer? RF stands for radio frequency. Do you have to be an RF you know engineer to understand you know how to change channel? No. What do you do? That, right? So change channel, channel up, channel down is an abstraction, okay? Because by the time it gets onto your remote control, you no longer need to understand radio frequency you know, engineering. You don't under need to understand how a TV works. You just say, I want to change the channel. That's all. Yep. Mm -hmm. Is the distinction either mapping the inputs to outputs or just the, com the compartmentalization of the Is the, you are basically abstracting what needs to be done, but from how it is done. Okay, so what you need to do, you know, in any classes, not just this one, what you need to do is to think about the three type of questions that you need to ask. The first one that most people will ask, or what they learn in class, okay, by taking notes and mechanically, you know, following the teacher, then only, that, that only takes care of the how. Okay, how something is done. The next question is, what are we doing, okay? Well, usually there are many ways to do the same thing, okay? And then the third question is, why are we doing it, okay? What is the value of doing it? Why is this even important, okay? So those are the three questions that you have to ask. So I will give you an example to, give, to, to tell you exactly what abstraction is using the homework assignment as an example, okay? All right. So when someone looks at the description of this uh, subroutine, okay, it doesn't take long, for someone to realize, oh, okay, I guess when we call this a subroutine, we have to give it the dividend and the divisor. The subroutine will automatically do the calculation and come up with the quotient and the remainder. And those will be stored as the third and the fourth you know, parameter of the function. Is that making any sense? Or not? Without reading the code you know, of the actual function itself, just by looking at the name of the function and also the name of the parameters, don't you think most people know, you know the, the, what the subroutine is going to do? You guess so. <laughs> you guess so. Okay, that's good enough for me. <laughs> okay, but how is it gonna do it? Well, do you care? If you are calling this subroutine to find out what is the quotient and the remainder of a division, do you really care how it's done? 
it may be implemented as a part of the processor, it may be done in a very slow way, like the, our previous homework assignment, or it may be done in a really fast way. But to you, it doesn't matter because all you really want is just the quotient and the remainder. Okay, so what I'll give, I'll do is I'll give you an example of what kind of details are we hiding from the person who's calling the subroutine. Okay, all right. So the first way to do this, and by the way, this is definitely not the answer to the quest to your homework assignment. So any submission with this as the answer will not only get a zero point, it will get a negative point. Okay, because I explicitly say it is not the way to do it. Okay, so one way to do this is to say, hey, quotient is really just dividend divided by divisor, and the remainder is dividend mod the divisor. That would be 100% correct if I did not give you the restrictions, okay? Because the restriction says, you know, you cannot use actual division. It's not here, but it is in the homework assignment itself. In the, on the website, there are you know, restrictions already. Okay, well, I'll just go ahead and show you. Come on, there we go. Yep. So do you, because you mentioned you have a program that checks these as well, so do you also go into our source code and like look at it thoroughly, or just kind of- Oh, like I manually it? read every single program. Okay. <laughs> I was curious like how, Critical the analysis is like if you really look at it or if it's oh I really love I really read all the programs okay yep okay so you know so these are the restrictions of your homework assignment you know, the assignments may involve the following recursion comparison subtraction increment ternary operator which I don't really think is necessary uh, because we have conditional statements so all of these are allowed what you're explicitly not allowed to do are divisions modulus or mod multiplication, loops, or go-tos. So those are, those are the things that you're explicitly told not to do. Yep. What's a go-to statement again? Um, something that you're not supposed to use anyway, so don't ask. <laughs> it's, a, it's a very explicit way for you to tell your program where to continue execution. So you can define a label, okay, which is kind of like a, a marker, okay, a tag. And then the go-to statement can refer to the name of the label and say, well, so once you get to a go-to statement, it will always continue execution at the label that it's going to. Did we already covered that stuff? No. Okay. No. We, I don't want to talk about go-to no, because it really is something that you're not, you're I not supposed to I just want to make sure use. you hadn't already gone over it. I just I didn't pay attention or something. No, but some people may know the go-to statement from other classes, and they may say, oh, if I cannot use a loop, that's okay. I can just use a go-to. No, you cannot use a go-to either. Yep, that just person would be you. <laughs> <laughs> yes? Just to clarify, when you say loops of any kind, that doesn't include if statements. Um, that's the other, like, construction right? Uh, loops of any kind will only include while, do, for. So yeah, those are okay. the three loops that we cannot use. I just want to make sure you work. And you cannot just use a macro to shield the, the name loop or do a while. I know how some people think. <laughs> okay, so you're explicitly not allowed to do these things. Okay, so that's that's why you know this is not going to be a very good you know submission because it does use division and modulus. But this is how it is done. Okay, what is the other how of you know, this is done? Okay, so we'll we'll go. I'll go ahead and give you another example of the how versus the what. Okay. So I'll just copy the prototype of the function, and you know, just to make it so that it, it will compile, I can call the second one divide okay, one. Okay. Okay. So the other way to do this is to copy the solution from your other homework assignment. Okay. Because most of you have done the homework assignment to do division using a loop, so we can just do that. Okay. That's 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 something you can do here. So you can say quotient is initialized to zero. And then you can basically say, you can say while dividend is greater than or equal to divisor. I mean, I'm pretty sure you guys still remember this, right? Maybe plus plus quotient, quotient. And then you want to say dividend minus equal to divisor or, di or subtract divisor from dividend and then store the result back into dividend. When this exits, when the loop exits, then whatever is left in dividend is your remainder. So you can just say remainder equals to dividend. Okay, all right. 
So I'm, I, I think you know, half the class do remember this being the solution of the divide homework assignment. But this is not going to be OK you know, for this homework assignment because it involves loops. Okay? But what I want to illustrate here is not just what you cannot do, but also the concept of the how versus the what. Okay? All right, let's, let's go back to the concept of uh, how versus what. This is the how. Okay? We are using the divide operator. We are using the mod operator. This is the how. We are using a loop, okay? Using a conditional state, using a loop so that we can keep subtracting the divisor from the dividend until there's no more to divide. That is the how. But, but the what of both of these functions are the same. This function is going to give us the quotient and the remainder. This function serves the same purpose. It accomplishes the same thing by giving us the quotient and the remainder. That is the what. And having a function helps us separate the how or keep the how contained while um, the caller of the subroutine can focus on the what. Is that making any sense? Okay, let's try to relate it back to this, okay? So let's say that next level of uh, computer, uh, the next level of TV technology is, is magical, okay? It's not even based on physics or electronics. It's completely magical, okay? So now the question is, do you have to understand magic in order to increase the brightness? Because magic is the how, right? Do you care about the how? You buy a magical TV or a magical, you know, um, head up display and you say, oh, that looks a little too dark to me. I want to increase the brightness. What are you going to do? Learn magic? No. What are you going to do? Look for the remote control. Look for the button called increase brightness. Click. And it will magically increase the brightness. You don't need to learn the magic. That is what we are talking about. Abstraction or encapsulation. That is what you know, this is all about. But why is that important? Why is it important to you that you only have to learn how to use a remote control? Convenience. Because all the remote controls, independent of the technology or how things are done, they all look about the same. To you, the consumer, this is the same thing. Okay, you can buy a new TV. You don't have to relearn how to do something. What you learn about you know, you know, all the remote controls that you have used in the past, most of that, 78%, 95% of that, will still be applicable to the new TV and the, re and the new remote control. That is why. Okay? Are we doing okay so far with you know, the, the why part of abstraction? More or less? You want me to give you another example, but this time it is development or software you know, related. I can give you an example like that. Okay, all right, so let's go ahead and deal with an example. Okay, <clears throat> so let, let me give you an example of uh, controlling LEDs to display images, okay? Which doesn't sound very difficult, okay? So we're talking, talking about LED matrix di displaying you know, pictures. And I'm pretty sure you can find like you know, examples like that, okay? All right, so I want to write the program that can you know, control LEDs in order to display you know, uh, characters, pictures, and whatnot. That doesn't seem hard, right? But how would you identify each individual picture, uh, in, an individual pixel in a setup like this? Each pixel is identified by its X coordinate and Y coordinate. Makes perfect sense, right? This is just the usual way we do you know, planar, planar um, representation. Okay, well that's kind of cool. You can do it with an array. Hmm? You can do it with an array. But an array is kind of the same thing because you are specifying rows versus columns, okay. you know, or the element within a row. So they're basically you know, still about the same thing. Um, okay, so this is one way to do it. So. In, when you're dealing with a device like this, it is very natural for you to say, okay, I want to represent you know, a picture using you know, XY coordinate, okay? 
like the happy face, you know, would have you know these pixels turned on two pixels to represent the eye and a whole bunch of pixels rep representing the smiley face, the smiley mouth. Makes sense, right? So you wrote a program like that using x, y to represent the coordinate of each individ individual pixel. And then your boss gave you the next project, okay? The next project is still using LED to display images, but it is no longer a matrix type of setup. It is now a setup like this. Bicycle spoke Pretty sure I misspelled this. It should not be spelled like this. Spoke LED light bar. Okay, there we go. And we can add Pac Man. There we go. So your boss now gives you a new project. Okay, by the way, if you the, if you cannot see it, this is a bicycle kind of upside down, you know, with the I think the bike seat is over here and the handlebar is over here. And there's a light bar that is installed on the, on the spoke, and the wheel is being turned really fast. By turning on and off the LEDs on the spoke light, um, by doing this you know, in a certain way, you can actually you know, create the image of you know, Pac-Man chasing after a ghost. Is that okay? All right? So in this case, how would you represent a pixel? So you can say, I want that pixel to be on, I want that pixel to be off. X, Y is not natural anymore, is it? Because it's rotating. So how would you represent the location of a pixel? When you say pixel, you mean on the bar itself or the image you're trying to produce? On the image, on the, on the image to be produced. You can use the radius. You can use rotation and radius, right? Okay, so now you want to change the representation. But what if you already have a program that has all of all the function calls to a subroutine that say, display a pixel here using the XY coordinate, display a pixel here using XY coordinate. That is the what. You don't want to change the what. That is still what you want to do. But the how is now completely different because you're not controlling an LED in a matrix fashion. Now you're basically saying, okay, wait until the bar rotates to this position and then turn on that LED which is a certain radius from the center of rotation. That is the how. So if you design your program from the beginning to isolate the actual implementation detail from the front end you know, of how you actually want to specify a picture, then you don't have to do much change. You just have to change the underlying logic to display the pixel, and the rest of the program will still be the same. On the other hand, if you sprinkle the logic that depends on x, y coordinate all throughout the program, then you have a massive task to deal with because the rest of the program, the entire program, relies on the fact that you have x, y matrix type of representation. representation and to change that program to use a uh, angular or polar coordinate is going to be a, a major task. That is why abstraction is useful because it saves you, the developer, a lot of time when something needs to be changed, you only have to change the underlying representation or the underlying logic of certain subroutines, but not the entire program. Is that kind of okay or not? All right. Okay. So we're not using we're not using this on the homework assignment, right? We are not doing this in the homework assignment for sure. So what we are doing instead. Are you are you asking about the homework assignment? Okay, are you talking about this? Yeah. So we cannot we cannot use this solution because it involves the divide and mod operators, oh. and we cannot use this solution because it involves loops. So you have to use recursion to do it. Okay, when you think about recursion, what do you do? What is the first thing you say about recursion? Sorry? Okay, the subroutine has to call itself, but that's only when it is necessary, right? So because we are lazy people, we always think, well, when do I not have to call myself? Statement. Hmm? Conditional statement. You need a conditional statement to differentiate between the case when you need to call yourself again from the case where you do not have to call yourself again. Which one do you think I'm going to work on first? Exactly. Okay, so that, that's the first thing you have to do, is to think, um, 
when do I not have to call myself again because I have the answer right away? Okay, so you have to think about the relationship between the quotient, uh, not the quotient, you have to think about the relationship between the dividend versus the divisor. Okay, so you have to, based on the comparison of those two, okay, based on the result of the comparison of the dividend versus the divisor, when can you say, ah, that's an easy one, I, I can come up with the answer right away. And when can you say, oh, that is a little bit harder, okay, I can finish one part, but I'll leave the other part to somebody else to handle. Okay, that is the question. So you start with thinking like that when you're dealing with recursion. Are we doing okay so far with that? Sort of? Maybe? Do you guys want to see another example of recursion? I think more examples never hurt. Yep? Just real quick, kind of related to this. Um, okay, go ahead. If I, how do you, what would be the best way in BIM to move this code from one main .cpp to it, like her any C++ file to another C++ file within the Linux environment thing? Okay, so let me, you know, let me just record this part here because some other people may be interested. Okay, so the question is how do we copy or move some code from one source file to another source file in using VI, right? Yeah. That's the question. So let's say we have another main here, I'll just call it main B, okay? So main B is partially written, so we'll just say you know, void, divide, and uh, that's it, okay? So now I have main and main B, and I want to copy some code from main to main B, just the main function, yep. Just to add to it two different directories. Two different directories? Yeah, they're in two different directories. That's okay, I mean, okay. if they're in different directories, you can still use this approach. You can use vim dash o, okay? Uppercase or lowercase o, you know, they do slightly different things, but they are similar, okay? And then you provide a path to the, to the two files that you want to access. So if they're in different folders, you just have to supply the actual path to the files that you're dealing with, okay? But what the dash o does is it opens it up in two panes, upper and lower. So now they're both inside the same editor session, it's just that now we, we, we're sl splitting the screen between those two. So to copy the code, let's say I want to copy the entire main function here, the easier way is to turn on the line numbers. So to copy into the buffer is to say you know, line 12 to line 20, um, copy. Uh, yank, sorry, sorry. Y for yank. Yank is copy. Okay, so you say you know, 12 comma 20 Y, and that will yank those 20 lines, which is the same thing as Control C with a regular editor. And then you move on to the second window. Control W first, and then a J to move down to the second window. Okay, and now let's say we want to paste it right after this. P is paste, and now we have you know, the stuff copy from one file to the other. What does both the Control W and the J do? Control W says, you know, this app, the following operation applies to Windows, not applying to the cursor. Okay. And then J is what we usually do to move down the cursor one line. Okay. So that's why it's, that's why those two combine together to say move down by, by one window. Is that okay? Yeah. Okay. All right. QA all. Okay, there we go. Any other questions about the homework assignment? Oh, that's right. Another example. You guys want me to present another example where I can show you how to solve the problem. Not just the solution. If I just show you the solution, it's not going to be helpful. Yes? No? Yes? yes? Okay, good. So what I'll do is I'm going to write a program. I'll just put it somewhere else. Okay. Uh, I'll call this find factor. Okay. And what we'll do is um, to resemble your homework assignment, I'm going to do this using a void as a return type find factor and to find the factor that means I have to be given a number in which I want to find you know a factor so the factor since I'm not using return is going to be passed by reference there we go and I want to do this recursively okay all right to do this recursive mean to do this recursively means you know I cannot use a loop I have to use you know recursion I can use conditional statements just like what you can do in your homework assignment so what I need to do is to think of, oh, what is the easiest you know, solution, okay? All right, so we'll, I'll give you the structure of the code, okay? We have an if, turn on auto indent, 
There we go. All right, so we know, you know, with any most, not all, but with most recursive subroutines, you know, there's a conditional statement to differentiate the case where you can say, ah, I got the answer, I don't have to ask anybody else, as opposed to, well, I don't have the answer right away, but I can ask someone, which is a problem that is a little bit different from your problem to begin with, okay? So let's say, you know, the condition is gonna say, um, no need to call find factor again. Okay, so in which condition do we not have to uh, call find factor again? Well, when f is already a factor of n, right? Because if f is a factor of n, I can just stop. So now the question is, how do I know f is a factor of n? How can I confirm that? If f is a factor of n, that means n mod f is what? Zero. Is a zero, okay? There are two ways to express that. If you want to say you know, n mod f is zero, you can directly compare this to zero. That would do the trick, okay? But the other way to do this is to put a negation oops, to the expression itself. That will also confirm that n mod f is a zero. Okay, so we can choose one or the other way. This is definitely a less common way to do that, but it's you know it's used nonetheless. So in this case, oh, there is there's really nothing to do because f is already a factor of n. I'm done. Okay, nothing to do. Um, if n mod f is not zero, what are you going to do? You would you want to call again, but before you call again, what do you what do you want to do? You you what do you tell the next person? Try the next factor, right? Try the next number as the potential factor. So what you need to do here is to say, oh, let's go ahead and add one to f first. And then you say find factor and f. Okay? Because you know, because to you, the first thing it, the, this condition uh, failed. In other words, the n mod f gave you a non-zero result. That's how we can end up in the else case. So in the else case, you're basically saying, okay, well, since the f that I was working with is not a factor, maybe the next number is, but I'm not gonna, I'm not going to find it out. You're gonna find it out, call you, know, and call the subroutine again. Okay. So this is how we do, you know, find factor. Uh, is it helping? Is it helping you guys understand how to approach the homework assignment? Find out the case where you don't you don't need to call again. That's the first thing you need to do. And then you have to think about, okay, if that is not a simple case, how do I present this as a simpler case to the next invocation of the same subroutine? That's what you need to think about. Is that okay? Yeah. Sort of. Okay. Well, but you know, before we move on, we have to make sure that this does work, right? So we'll go ahead and give it a try. So we'll say and um, factor, okay? This is our actual variable. Now with this program, not yours, okay? But this program factor has to be initialized outside of the subroutine. So we have to say, we have to say factor is starting with two first because one is, you know, every number is divisible, divisible by one. Then we can call find factor. In fact, you know, we can say what is a factor of 91, okay? And we want to store that into factor, return zero. So we'll try out this program to see whether it finds either seven or 13. GCC or G++, you know, either way works over here. Dash C, find factor dot C. Link the program, g to me, find factor. And we'll put a breakpoint on line 20, run the program. Now we're on line 20, and we'll say, what is what is factor? Factor is seven, seven is a factor of 91. The program does work, okay? Are there any questions about um, this, your homework assignment? No questions, you guys feel Okay, kind of comfortable. Yep. What's it do? One week. You have one week to work on it. 
but I would suggest you guys to work start working today okay you know like right after class would be a good time to start working on it you may not come up with a solution right away but getting started to get your brain rolling it is important yep are these gonna be unsigned numbers um right now we're just dealing with signed numbers if that's okay we'll, I'll only give you non negative values to test okay and I won't give you division by zero so don't worry about that you any other questions? We got five minutes left, or four, which is perfect because I need to give you your reading assignment. Okay, what are we gonna deal with next? So your reading assignment is going to be, okay, let me go back up first. <clears throat> reading the rest of library, libraries and modular programming is important, but the next thing we'll deal with is scope and lifespan of variables and also input and output using <coughs> files. So those two you know, are the reading assignments for this particular weekend. On next Monday, we'll probably spend about, well, it shows here, you know, which is hour and a half to talk about uh, scope and lifespan, but we have talked about that already to a certain degree. So it's not gonna be as much time. Um, the one thing that we will talk about in terms of scope and lifespan of variables is I'll tell you about global variables. Okay, but the only thing I will tell you about global variables, at least at this point, is don't use them. <laughs> okay, because the use of global variables is going to make programs very difficult to maintain down the line. Okay, it's hard to find out where problems are when you use a lot of global variables. So for the most part, this topic is just going to be quick. This is going to be a bigger topic. Okay, input and output using files. And since we do have your two minutes left, let me ask you what you think is a file. What is a file in the sense, in, in, in the context of computer science? What is a file? If, if, if there's an image in your mind right now, you know, okay, you know, what, how would you describe a file on a computer? It's a collection of ones and zeros. Okay, a collection of zeros and ones. Okay. Anything else? A document? Sorry? It's a location. Okay, a location where information is stored, okay? Anything else? Does anyone else want to bring up something you know, what you can write on? Uh, something you can write on, okay. Yep. Uh, it has a specific task and instruction for the computer. Okay. So you're looking at files from the perspective of a user, okay? On the other hand, a computer, especially from the perspective of a C, C++ program, a file is completely different. Okay, the files that we're gonna deal with resembles more like conveyor belts. So there's one conveyor belt going into a program where things will arrive in order, one by one, okay? And there are three conveyor belts out co going out of a program where you can put stuff on the conveyor belt and say, I wanna you know, send this out, I wanna send this out, I wanna send this out. So the only thing you can really do about files, okay, in that chapter is you can read something from a file, or you can write something to a file. In other words, reading is the same thing as receiving something from a conveyor belt. Writing is the same thing as putting something on a conveyor belt that is going out of the program. Okay? But hold on a second here. Where is that stuff stored when I am putting something on a conveyor belt? I have no idea. Okay? That is not the question. In other words, these files, cortical files, do not even have names. They don't have a place in a directory structure. They're simply a conveyor belt. For all we know, the conveyor belt can connect directly into the recycle bin. Yep. So, so from that description, the files can actually like pass by value parameters. Like you can pass the value in, and then if you do modify it or alter it or something, then you can pass out a value again. Right? Which is what I'm getting. Like, Wait, wait, wait. How, how is that related to files? I, I'm, I'm well, missing that part. Well, I was just thinking, like, so in terms of, because main itself is like a function in a sense, right? So the files pass the. Like, nope, pass nope, the nope. File is completely different. Okay, a file is a construct where it is, it's a window, it's, it's an interface to a conveyor belt. That's the best way to describe a file from the perspective of a program. You're, you're basically, you, you have a little window, and that's the, that's the interface that you have to a conveyor belt. What can you do with that window? You can grab something from the conveyor belt, 
for certain types of files, you can put something onto the conveyor belt with other types of files. Those are the only things you can do to files from the perspective of a C, C++ program. Well, at least at this point. Okay, so we'll go ahead and deal with that on next Monday. This is going to be a very important, you know, lesson. So you know, when, you, when you open this up, there are subtopics here. You can definitely see that there are lots of stuff already written, so you might want to read, it, read that and understand what that is. Okay, so I was wondering uh, uh, if you could take, like, if, if as a program is using values from your file, you could be modifying those values in the source file much in the way that pass by reference works. No, it's, it's completely it, different. It can't work at all like that. Nope, not at all. Yep. All right. Any other questions? Yep. Oh, I forgot about that. I can do that on Wednesday. Um, I, I, I can do it today. They're not marked in any way. So if you are interested to get your exam back and do it here, it'll just take a little bit of time. Is there, is there five or six questions? There are six questions of which I have only graded two okay. at um, this point. Yesterday I left early, but you were on question uh, question five. I did, I, left, go, did, I did go over all questions. You did? In that class. Okay. Yep. I'll have to go back through. Is it okay if I grab mine?